Yeah, I have a video that I've been meaning to make for a long time. I just haven't found the time. And the working title is, Yes, Facts Are Socially Constructed. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about the notions of ontology and epistemology in the social world and how science produces facts that impact us. It's, it's going to be similar to the talk I'm going to give um, in, uh, for Professor Mario Arde's seminar in, in the autumn about science, scientists as knowledge producers and then the knock-on effect that has on our perception of, of our realities. So, yeah. yeah. But that video really needs to get made because when people laugh at the idea that that social the facts are socially constructed, I'm like, you might as well laugh at the theory of evolution. It, yeah, yeah. Just, well, uh, it's just, exactly because evolution was a concept that was around before the theory of evolution was codified. It was pe like people like had looked at apes and gone, hey, they look kind of like humans. Wonder if that's a thing, you know, much before um, <laughs> the origin of species was written. People knew about that. They just hadn't codified it into a, a proper theory and so the idea that that um, darwin came along and discovered it for the first time is not accurate and it, it really goes to sh the, to describe the difference between a term and the theory around that term you know or a concept and the theory built around that concept and it's the same it's exactly the same with patriarchy that's why the the term patriarchy without theory on the end has a different meaning because it's it's a symptom of the thing that patriarchy theory is about, not the whole thing, just part of it. And it's the same with uh, germ theory. You know, people knew sort of what germs were, but they didn't have a total understanding of it and it was incomplete. You know, and that's what scientific theories are. They come along and they take a pre existing, I guess, problem, you'd call it, or thing, and um, sort of work it out and structure it into a, into a nuanced argument that's, you know, complete, or mostly complete at least, you know. The yeah, most complete recently, one we have available. Yeah, recently, again, Carl Sargon sort of did a random tweet at me to get his followers, I guess, to, to say things about matriarchy or patriarchy. And I replied back that, you know, patriarchy is a theory and a fact. Yeah, just like evolution. Like the, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and if you debate me on patriarchy instead of avoiding the debate and the question <laughs> he words himself, we could discuss this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah what, what time Maybe he Sargon can prepare too well again. <clears throat> he'll read some books this time yeah <laughs> yeah right yeah <laughs> yeah what, what sargon and a lot of them do is they look at the dictionary definition of patriarchy and they go oh, this isn't what feminists talk about when they say patriarchy and the reason for that is because social scientists have a more in-depth understanding of the things they talk about than normal people do just like any expert and so they develop shorthand versions of things so they can talk to each other efficiently so they use the term patrilineal descent to describe what the dictionary definition of patriarchy is. And they use the word patriarchy as a part of their patriarchy theory. And so they just use different words for things. And it's because they're experts on it. You know, and it's the same with any field of study. They have shorthands because they talk to each other and they don't want to have to say 30 second long things when they're, you know, referencing something. Even when you put examples down in front of them, like the patriarchy is a real thing was Stephen passed um, at past he's talking about how he you know he's not going to vote for a woman because a woman shouldn't be president of the United States because women shouldn't vote and how he's the authority in his house and he's not going to tell a woman what to believe because uh, she should ask her husband because yeah. you know he is her authority and you point this out and people go and people in the comments you know the anti-femmes go along go he's just a religious nutbag this isn't evidence of patriarchy like, like this is exactly That's like he was a human being living in society, right? Yes. <laughs> and being Christian yeah. doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. It's like you're pointing out fossils to creationists. Like, That's not a transitional fossil. Like, yes, it is a transitional fossil. Look at the evidence. Just look yeah. at the definition and the theory and then the evidence. You can see it all fits together. I'm like, that's not patriarchy. It doesn't matter what you show them. I can talk about male victims of rape and how patriarchy keeps the myths going that men can't really be raped. Yeah. Um, men always want sex, and they'll still deny that the patriarchy is a problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then they come to us and tell us that our, like, you can't just look at the world based on your preconceived notions. But like, that's a, yeah. Do you not <laughs> yeah. see the irony of this? <laughs> It's amazing eh? because it's not like I was born knowing that uh, patriarchy is a thing, you know. I had to actually look it up and read stuff. Yeah. So it's not about. You know, I denied it for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I understand it because that's the nature of academic research is that there's a sort of 
and this is a, this is a problem, especially in hard sciences, where there's a sort of um, it's like a in-group, out-group thing that people on the outside get sort of, it feels esoteric to them and, and off-putting and it feels like they don't have a way in, you know? Like my, my mum actually was talking about that with, with GMOs, that she was, was anti-GMO for a long time. And part of the reason was, is because the way scientists talk about anti-GMO people and the anti-GMO ideas is in a sort of dismissive and the condescending way. And it's understandable because that's, scientists talking about anti-science rhetoric, but it's not actually productive and helpful in terms of convincing people on the outside and changing their minds. So if they were a bit more, and that's one of the reasons why I try to be civil on my channel, because if you actually want to change people's minds, calling them names doesn't help. You know, it's actually the opposite. It really hurts. So yeah, and I think um, the scientists, the sciences and social sciences as well, have a way of, of making people feel excluded. And I don't even know if it's possible to, to be helped because of the nature of what academic research is and how you need to spend years and years doing it. It's like medical science, you know. You throw around medical terms to casual observers and most of the time they won't even know what the hell you're talking about, you know. Mm -hmm. But that just sort of has to be how it is because they need to be able to talk to each other and they need to be able to, you know, have a shorthand about the way they talk about things. I think there is a, an onus on, on scientists generally, whether in the um, social or the natural, which I prefer to the hard and soft um, sciences. Um, be, because, um, yeah, we do use terms and they're important that they're defined. Of course, you know, one of the problems that you've experienced is that when you define it in a more sophisticated way, then you get the pile on of people who refuse to accept it. So there's also the side of, um, you know, the commenters to, to give a fair hearing to something and work within the operational terms laid out by the person speaking and judge it on those merits. Don't try to shift the goalposts and say, no, you need to fit it to this narrow definition or this simpler definition. Give me this concept in, you know, less than three sentences. Yeah. The world doesn't work like that. It takes some effort sometimes. That's yeah. called definitional retreat. Yeah. Yeah. When you, when you disagree with a, piece of rhetoric based on the way that they're what they're talking about is defined instead of actually looking at what they're talking about yeah it happens a ton yeah mm -hmm. yeah if you want to do that then you have to make their arguments basically you need to make your, my arguments but based on your definition mm -hmm. so do that show me how you know in my my thing about egalitarian zone of being 55 percent to 45 percent and congress still being a patriarchal institution because it's overwhelmingly male by like 80 percent male mm. then you know show me an alternative measure show me how the same data can be presented to come to a different conclusion don't just complain about my measures or my, yeah. my definition and and the, the funny thing about the, the the government thing is people will often say, Oh, you don't know that it's because they're excluding women. Maybe women just don't want to run for office as much as men do. So okay, we, firstly, where's your evidence for that? Because they don't have any evidence for that. And secondly, basically you're doing the same thing you're accu that um, you're accusing me of by coming up with a reason that is well, in your case, it's not based on anything. Like my reason is is because there's a sort of a, a tend a, society has a way of discouraging women and you know other groups of people from doing certain things or wanting to be involved in certain you know uh, careers or whatever and the thing is that is actually measurable you can measure that and ask women and see what they say about it and see what they think so to disregard my and then we're just talking about people's feelings <laughs> yeah and that's not hard that's not hard facts because that's what they feel yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. That, that is actually the core, I think, of the complaint about social research is that you can't ask human beings how they feel about things. That's not science. It's like when you're talking about how the way human beings feel about things, that is science. <laughs> when, you know, it's not science if you're talking about There's physics, really, but that's not what you're talking really no about. Better way to do it. Yeah, there is no, and there probably never will be unless we develop mind uh -huh. reading, you know, which hopefully yes. we won't. One day. <laughs> One day. <laughs> if you're guided by the scientific process, then yeah. shouldn't the conclusions that you draw be called scientific? Why would they not be? Why would they not be scientific if, at every stage of the process, you use the scientific method? Exactly. And just because society changes over time in a way that the laws of physics doesn't, doesn't matter. You can factor just as long as you factor that the reality of that in, and make sure that you do um, enough uh, checking and rechecking of established theory. You know, you don't have to double check the theory of gravity every day, but um, in social sciences, you kind of do need to keep checking things. 
and keep trying to falsify things more so than you might need to do in hard science. As long as you make up for that or acknowledge that fact by doing that extra amount of work, there is no problem, you know. But yeah, apparently there's not enough false, false and it, then they'll just say, oh, you can't falsify the stuff. They don't actually well, then they don't understand falsification. <laughs> yeah, that is something that they attack constantly. It's like, you can't falsify that. It's like, well, give me actually, they just say that, you know, they don't actually say you can't falsify it because of X, Y, and Z. They just say you can't. Okay, then. Yeah, yeah. When, they, when they say that to me, I go, well, I, I've read my thesis out on YouTube. It's on my channel. Um, it uses feminist theory, and I use statistical analysis, and I have null hypotheses. Go read how it's done. Because mm, mm, mm. it's done all the time in, in, the, in, the, in the sociology journals, in economic journals, in political science journals, in human rights journals. It's done all the time. Yeah, but so, the, the problem is that, yeah. that these people don't even know what null hypothesis is, you know. So, yeah. They, they, they have to do a certain amount of work before they could even get to the point where they could do that, you know. And this and is actually a work. symptom. This is a symptom of the, it's a, it's a criticism too of the natural science approach in that they use science, but they don't understand the tool. They don't exactly. understand the philosophy behind the process that they're using. They're just like, okay, you, walk, you follow these steps and that's, that's what you do. And we can debate, you know, maybe some of the evidence based on, you know, margins of error or whatever else. But, you know, this is science. And, um, you know, I actually have a lot of criticisms of um, the natural sciences and I, I actually think the social sciences are better in certain ways. One of them is interdisciplinary um, capabilities. But another one is, there's a, there's a, have you read the book by Bill Bryson, A Short History of Nearly Everything? It's basically a history, it's a biography of a group of scientists, a set of scientists, and a sort of a history of science kind of thing. And it talks about the cycle that happens with new scientific theory, where one person or a small group of people will come up with a theory, champion it, put, put it forward at like, a, they'll go to some academy of science, royal sciences in Britain or whatever, and uh, to a room full of hundreds of scientists of their same discipline, they'll put forward this thing, they'll get routinely mocked and laughed out of the room, then over the course of about, uh, in the previous centuries, it would take about 40 years, where more and more people would start drip, dripping into the idea that this, is a, this theory is sound, and over the course of that, it'll get to the point where the people who know, who, it'll switch, where the people who dis discount it get laughed out of the room, and then scientific consensus on it is reached after decades. Right? It's quicker than that now, but that is essentially the process, right? If, if, in, the, if in those times, like, the physical laws of the world did change, the natural sciences would be screwed. Because it happens too fast, you know, they take too long to get on board with things. Whereas in the social sciences, people are a bit quicker, they move quicker, and they're able to adapt quicker because they know that the field that they're studying is changing, you know, in some cases changing fast. So yeah, yeah. I think of them as, as being more rigorous in certain ways, more adaptable, more open-minded. Hmm. That, that sounds a lot like Kuhn. Um, and I can't remember the name of the title now because it's getting after midnight here, but um, he also talks about how paradigms exist within disciplines like um, in, in sciences and then some revolutionary ideas come over and eventually overtake the paradigm or become a different part of the, the dominant paradigm. And this yeah. is an, you know, an ongoing process. Uh, yeah, and in the social sciences, you know, one of the nice things is that we can take data collected in the past and we have a new theory, we can go back and look at old data through a new lens. For right. instance, with the gender gap, you know, that was first observed when uh, the New York Times published Carter's vote by sex and Reagan's vote by sex. And the president of now noticed that there was like a six or eight point gap in difference between how men and women voted. And they coined the unfortunate term, the gender gap. It's alliterative, but it really should be the sex gap, in my opinion. But moving on from that, you know, once they discovered it in the 1980s, they started observing it going forward. And then some scholars who took feminist critique went back and looked at the data and they could find it actually back to the 1960s. It had right. been there for decades, but because no one thought to look, people didn't think sex was playing a role in predicting vote choice. And in the, I think in Britain, it goes back into the 1950s. But in the 1970s in Britain, they were still coding a woman's occupation by her husband's occupation, not hers. So they were making women invisible in a lot of ways, making it more difficult to see one of the things that was a, a source of variation, which was the sex of the person voting. So that's a nice, you know, it's one thing that we're aware of, and we, we do um, not only look at new theories going forward, but then we can go reanalyze data from that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I really 
champion the uh, level of interdisciplinary skill that is evident throughout most of the social sciences, the way that different disciplines can work together, the way new disciplines are created out of that, you know, like, for example, in um, Nina Licky's book, uh, Feminist Studies, she talks about um, tons of different subgroups within gender studies. And one of them is, uh, I'll probably get the name wrong, but uh, is it the the study of me, of men and masculinities, oh, men and masculinity studies, which is all about the difference. It was uh, the interplay between gender and sex, like I was talking about. That's what mostly that book is about. And uh, it talks about how you know um, the male side of gender studies is um, often done through the lens of analyzing what it, what masculinity is and what it means in different ways it can be categorized and divi divine, uh, defined and analyzed. And uh, yeah, th that's the sort of fast moving um, subgrouping, you know, because uh, that ma men and masculinity studies isn't, isn't just gender studies. It's just, there's people doing it who are sociologists, cultural anthropologists, you know, the, all the usual suspects in the social sciences who can be part of that study, even though they might not have come up through gender studies, the field that actually created it in the first place. And not only can they, they kind of need to. That, the way social science works is that you need to have lots of different disciplines analyzing the same data set in different ways, because that's how you can come to a consensus about it. If, if sociologists look at it and come up with a certain um, consensus and then cultural anthropologists look at it and come up with roughly the same thing, you can be pretty sure that even though those, because two totally different groups of people with different, vaguely different methods, different ideas about the world can come to the same conclusion about something, you know? which is one of the reasons why I have a lot of disagreements with psychology because, well, not social psychology, but normal psychology because of all their weird disagreements with sociologists. Well, if I could uh, kind of toot my own research horn here <laughs> um, to, to make your point about it's, it's interdisciplinary work. In July, I was at a conference that is uh, made up of people who are interested in studying non-believers. It's a conference on like um, uh, non-belief and unbelief. And they, I went to the conference really not knowing what to expect, and I would say about 90% of it was qualitative work done primarily on atheists um, around the world, or people who are um, basically, you know, not out atheists, but practicing atheists, like the, um, the Sunday gatherings that are happening in the UK. And one of the things that I wanted, well, what happened is um, the group that put on the conference is also associated with a team that has won uh, a funding grant from a research, um, like, charity institution that does research on social issues to look more into the notions of unbelief and non-belief and not only has our team won grant money to do research but they are also able to sort of parse out small bits of research to other teams to do more specific research and i'm gathering with with my quantitative background with people who have worked on um, european and international social surveys and have an interest in atheism and the measures of religion and religiosity and our proposal that we're trying to put together now would actually um, do a pilot study of measures for non-belief in countries around the world like japan and Brazil, um, you know, some other ones that we haven't finished our case study selection yet. But the idea would be to try to understand the distributions of non-belief in different countries and then make measures for international so social surveys and other in, you know, national social surveys that instead of just having a big block of nuns when it comes to, you know, what religion do you, ident do you identify with, you would actually have categories there that we could start tracking and understanding the non-believing community. Right. So that's yeah. an example of how interdisciplinary cooperation can lead to, you know, um, social science understanding atheism better as a movement and as a social phenomenon in the West and in other parts of the world. I just wanted to um, quickly go back to what I was just saying about cultural anthropology. That's, that's a great example because cultural anthropology is, I'm fairly certain, a part of the humanities. It's not even a social science. And so is what I studied. I studied history at university. And that's not social science, but because of the amount of interdisciplinary work that's being done in modern academic fields, uh, people like me can get a foot in, and you know can can get a, a foot in the door of social research and you know be part of it and, and understand it, because it's not a a huge leap between the two. There's a lot because there's so much work being done, collaborative work being done between those groups, you know. Um, that it's, it's very, um, as long as you are academically minded and not a natural scientist, um, because they seem to have a big problem <laughs> with getting their foot in the door and a lot of the stuff for some reason, um, 
yeah, the, it is, it, it feels very open and collaborative and um, which is to me a really good and productive and constructive thing, you know, because if you look at natural scientists, a lot of them discuss other fields of inquiry in quite dismissive and disdainful ways, even really respectful people, uh, respected people like the one I always bring up is Richard Feynman, who there's a video of him on YouTube, you can probably find where he's like bagging on social science and he, in a way that he makes it clear, he doesn't even understand it. You know, he's criticizing something without even understanding it, which is not scientific, you know, uh, it's disappointing. Yeah, I know for, you know, as a social scientist, I think generally we're interested in good theories that work and explain the things that we're um, observing and help us understand ourselves and our societies better. And whether that you know, initially comes from economics or it comes from sociology, who cares if it works? Let's, let's see, let's test the data. Let's see if we get more explanation here. And you, there's a lot of theories that come over from economics into political science. One is um, Olson's logic of collective action to explain why people, why grassroots movements don't perform as well as special interest groups that are very small. Or the media voter theory, which is based on economic theory of how shops organize themselves in a physical sort of geographical location to compete for customers. Customers, right. which is not at the extreme ends of town, but in the dead center of town, almost running right next to each other and using this to apply to parties. So yeah, we just want good theories. And we're willing to test out theories on data and, and see what happens. And yes, as, you know, from the point of view of a historian, that is exactly why the interdisciplinary thing is so important because historians don't really, aren't theorists for the most part. We need to rely on other disciplines coming up with the theory that we can use to analyze the world, the past, you know, or in some oh. cases for some historians, the present. Um, yeah. And, and so like, if, you know, from the point of view of a historian, you look back, you can use feminist theory as a tool to analyze history, you know, in a new way that you probably couldn't before, because if you just go by the text, women are basically invisible for the most part, you know, apart from the wives of powerful people who sometimes had insidious influence or whatever, you know. Um, yeah, so in order to actually understand um, history better, um, feminist theory is actually pretty important. Well, if you care about the history of women, you know. Well, and I think my whole series now on Did Jesus Exist makes a lot more sense because, you know, I hear our, um, Airman, you know, if he gives talks and I, I read his books and I'm just thinking you can make such a better argument. Just look, use it like a theory. Just, you know, <laughs> I think that's mm -hmm. an example of the interdisciplinary stuff where um, we're looking at the same stuff, but I'm looking at it completely differently because in my head I'm composing a theoretical evaluation there to see how well my theory performs. And well, yeah, so, yeah, I think you're right. That you're those cooperations are helpful. You're looking at it in a, con in a specific context, whereas most historians don't, their context is the particular time and place that they're talking about. And that's about it, you know? Um, so yeah, a lot of the time it's quite simplistic. The analysis that's done, like, especially if you go back to the classics, so much of the stuff that is written about uh, Greek and Roman times is very reductive. And uh, f when you read it, it feels like there's a lot missing, you know, that there's a lot, there's more not being said than what is being said, you know, especially when it comes to people like women or like trying to get the history of slaves in the Roman yes. empire. That's tough because it's almost never mm -hmm. talked about. They're trying to work out the conditions of like, it was a sort of thing where people just didn't talk about it. So trying to work out the actual living conditions of like the slaves in the Roman empire is tricky, you know? Mm. Yeah. All right. Should we talk about something else? Why don't we talk about politics? <laughs> That's always yes. fun. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Tom, have a go here. I've been chatting a lot, so I'll, I'll throw in the ball. Well, how yeah, about that, this one? That kind of makes... I was just going to say that um, one, one thing that um, I definitely, I don't know about your viewers, Christy, but I definitely know where you stand. But one thing I want to know about uh, what Tom thinks is about Hillary Clinton. Um, yeah, that's going to be interesting, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> um, I think it's very, um, like, or maybe not interesting, but it's just interesting that, like, she is, like, the one who, first woman in office, because, I mean, you know, there have been other female candidates who have run in the past, not on a this big of a level, though. But I think it's just it's the fact with the establishment at this point that makes her a shoe in. Yeah. And actually, that is really what I wanted to get into, because there's a lot of what I was kind of uh, getting at with that question is that as I was wondering is, are you one of the people because I'm, I'm guessing based on what I know of you that you were a Bernie supporter, Tom? Like um, myself? From a 
pragmatic, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, it puts me in a tough spot uh, as somebody who's, you know, critical of the state and all that. But I think Bernie was definitely like, like with this guy, you know, and, but as he's a politician, he can, you know, back down on anything. And that's basically exactly what happened is that he yeah. completely moderated and then supported Hillary, which like, you know, a lot of people really were upset at him for that. Um, and I might've been one of them. I was just like, yeah. I think you know, such a platform, a lot of the people who would, were um, pissed off at that, no offense, but were younger people, people who are a bit more idealistic and less pragmatic than somebody like me, mm. who people like in my uh, age bracket. <laughs> yeah, you know? but I'm in my 30s, you know, and to me, like, yeah, I was a Bernie supporter, but at the same time, I'm very much a pragmatist. And, um, uh, you know, when he didn't win, I was, I was like, he better fucking endorse Hillary because, like, that is just that is from a practical point of view that is what he basically had to do because yeah he wasn't going to win and and his his revolutionary idea wasn't even about who who is president that actually isn't the most important thing it's more about state yeah. level legislation actually um, it's just the mark the mark that he left with that camp unprecedented even i think like, in our you know. lifetimes certainly yeah progressivism has basically been dead since jimmy yeah. carter yeah. Somebody who really what um happened with like Obama in two thousand eight where everybody was like, you know, with him it was like a lot of people were coming out more than they usually do to vote. Yeah. Pretty amplified that effect by a, a couple times over, I think. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, what I was um saying was that there's a there's a lot of Bernie supporters who are now Hillary supporters in a in a in a because of a like a um best of both well what is it what's the term? Um you know, uh, lesser of two evils kind of thing, right? But they're like, well, you know, yeah. I'm not a supporter of her, but she's better than the other guy, so I'm going to vote for her or support her. Um, I'm so not like pretty much every I'm not one of those people. Um, I am a Hillary supporter now, but not just because of that. I, take, I actually take it further than that. And um, the reason is, is because after uh -huh. the primaries ended, I kind of had a revelation about the nature of politics and the inevitabilities of who the first female president was always going to be, not as a person, but in terms of their policies, because in, like most of the Western world, if you look at who their first female leader was, this actually isn't the case in my country, but in most Western countries, the first female leader is a war hawk, uh, is very much a political insider um, with tons of connections among the powerful elites, because they have to have that in order to be the first female head of state. That's just like a prerequisite. You can't make it in a boys club unless you're basically one of the guys, you know, um, for yeah. all intents and purposes. So basically to me, it comes down to um, the, what I'm saying is I don't believe the I want a first female president, but just not that one argument. I don't think that's valid because that is always going to be who the first female president of the United States is going to be. Someone like Elizabeth Warren doesn't really have a shot. You know, with her yeah. policies the way they are. She's not going to be president with those policies. She's not going to be the first female president with those policies. She might be yeah. the second or third, but not the first. Yeah. That's just how it works, you know. It's the same with Obama. Obama's a war hawk. Obama has tons of political connections and is an insider. It's the same thing, you know. Mm -hmm.